a wonderful Wednesday afternoon on the Joy News channel. You're welcome to The Pulse. We're coming to you live from our studios here in Kokumlimli. Fresh round of exchanges between retired Auditor General Daniel Yao Domelevo and the board chairperson following a directive for him to hand over within two weeks. He says he can't hand over what was not handed to him. Ghana's quest to achieve universal health coverage by the year 2030 is under threat following the outbreak of COVID-19 and many other factors impeding the country's push. We're going to speak to the Ghana Health Service and send Ghana on what we can do together to turn things around. Plus, the budget debate in Parliament will take you there live. Right, so let's get started. And Ghana's quest to achieve universal health coverage uh, by the year 2030 is under threat following the outbreak of COVID-19 and many other factors impeding the country's push. Uh, there have been disruptions in healthcare service, supplies uh, of essential medicines and personal protection equipment in health facilities. High COVID-19 infections have also been recorded among health service providers. Now, one key tool in achieving health care for all is primary health care. And no wonder it dominated the health aspects of the 2020 election manifestos of leading parties, the NDC and the NPP. So, how do we strengthen primary health care to help bring us back on track to the country's 2030 target of achieving universal health care? Uh, we have experts from the Ghana Health Service and the development NGO Send Ghana. Uh, Deputy Director of Policy, Policy Planning, uh, Monitoring and Evaluation Division, uh, Ghana Health Service, Dr. Andrew Yim, uh, joins us via Zoom. Also on Zoom is Country Director for Send Ghana, George Bimpe. Uh, we're helping Ghana develop uh, programs that will help improve primary health care. George and Andrew, good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. All right. So, Andrew, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Uh, why don't you help us get as clear an understanding of, as possible of what primary health care is in Ghana? Right. It would appear that uh, we've uh, lost Andrew there. But um, if we have George with us, uh, perhaps, George, we can start with you. And uh, I'm particularly interested okay. um, in uh, the role that Send Ghana is playing uh, in, uh, well, push, boosting the provision of primary health care in Ghana. Well, Kaja, um, thank you very much. Um, in terms of our understanding, the best understanding that is provided is uh, the World Health Organization, in which um, you know, it seeks to define uh, primary health care as a whole society approach to health care and well-being. And that is basically centered on the needs and the preferences of individuals, family and, and, uh, families and communities. Basically, primary health care um, addresses determinants of health care and uh, uh, focuses on the comprehensive and interrelated aspect of the uh, physical environment, uh, mental and social well-being. And if we uh, go into detail, there are different dimensions of the um, uh, of primary health care that we are talking about. The first one is that health care that meets the people's needs. And this must be through comprehensive um, you know, promotion, protection, prevention, and then curative, as well as rehabilitative and um, palliative, that is taking care of managing situations um, throughout the life cycle of um, an individual or a community. And so basically, we are talking about um, not only the provision of the services per se, but we are talking about measures that would promote um, um, health care, that will prevent it, that would um, is also reflect the needs and the aspirations yes, of the community. But most importantly, what something that we often don't talk, talk about is the social, economic, and environmental aspect of healthcare. Um, the level of education of, of individuals, access to social services, you know, um, health, um, including education, um, water and sanitation, um, the need to take care of the environment so that in the, in a, when we are talking about prevention, we do not cause damage to the environment in a way that exposes us to 
all forms of um, um, illnesses and so on and so forth. And if you look at the, 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 the uh, if you look at Ghana since um, the Amata Declaration in 1975, various governments have taken different um, uh, you know different steps or approaches or strategies to ensure that we have universal um, health care, but then using primary, um, uh, primary health care as a strategy. And so in Ghana, one of the flagship interventions that government over the years have been using since I think 2000 that about has been the, um, the chief concept or the community um, and health planning systems where um, you know, health care is taken to the doorsteps of the community members and there is community involvement in health planning. Um, there is emphasis on co um, health education um, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, reproductive health issue, environmental health issues are all part of this. Um, so basically, if you ask me, this is what um, healthcare. I mean, I mean, the the, the uh, primary healthcare is all about. And in Ghana, it is quite refreshing to know that in recent times, the Ministry um, of Health and the Ghana Health Services have taken steps to put in place a roadmap towards universal health coverage. And in that roadmap, primary healthcare or the package definition of the package of primary healthcare is quite prominent. And I think that. Now that we have COVID, it raises different different issue, uh, issues that I think in the course of the discussion we will talk about. Thank you very much. No doubt. In fact, I am quite interested in the impact COVID-19 has had on your project. Uh, it's a global uh, pandemic. Everybody has had to change their, you know, their modus operandi to, uh, to ensure that we can battle this uh, disease. But in some parts of our country, uh, well, I mean, healthcare is such a, a luxury. How has COVID-19 impacted on uh, Send Ghana's, uh, well, efforts to ensure that every Ghanaian is able to have access to primary health care? Well, I, I would rather put it this way. We, at Send Ghana, we have had challenges like any other um, organization. Our flexibility uh, to adapt to the situation um, has helped us to navigate their waters. And so I rather would want to focus on how uh, COVID-19 has impacted on um, uh, primary health care and if you like the relationship between the two. And the first point I want to make is that for me or for us, primary health care presents um, a lifeline, a first borderline in terms of protection. Um, so for example, if we are, you know, serious about primary health care, um, you know, in terms of devoting resources, ensuring that human um, capital is there, the, one of the things that we talk about of whenever uh, COVID comes up is the uh, people with underlying conditions. So if we were taking, uh, if we have, our health care is very responsive to people with hypertension, diabetes, uh, cholesterol situation, and so on and so forth, we already would then be providing the first, um, you know, the, the first line of defense to these people, so that um, we will they, they they will be supported even in, in situations where they 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 become infected with uh, um, COVID COVID nineteen. But it seems that um, depending on the social status of an individual and how that person is suffering from any of these conditions and where the person finds himself. For example, if you have the means to afford, you know, specialized care, uh, and you are not in a rural area uh, where you may not even have a doctor or you may not even have a nurse or the facilities may not be there, you are likely to be taken care of if you get COVID-19 or you may be or having access to health care because you have the financial means and that you are able to, uh, you know, afford medication if you have BP or if you have uh, diabetes and so on and so on. But people in, who are in economically difficult situation or socially uh, difficult situation in terms of even geography, where they find themselves and they are not getting um, the kind of health care that maybe you and I will get in Accra, already we, um, we, they, they become vulnerable to COVID-19. So if they get COVID-19, the fact that they don't have that frontline protection 
um, you know, exposing them to higher risk. And that is where primary health care becomes very important. And I would say that we don't even need to treat COVID-19 as a separate case from primary health care, um, the, full, the full package. For me, it should be integrated into primary health care issues so that um, COVID-19 is treated as any of the uh, any of the um, other um, um, diseases that can affect a person's life, um, whether it takes the person away or affect the person's life economically or so, uh, 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 socially. One of the things that we uh, we also have come across was, was that initially, I think now it has changed a little bit, initially, because many people were moving away from facilities that had been designated as um, and places for treatment of COVID-19. So in, when, when we had this case, many of the facilities that we, we, we visited and many of which had been dedicated to treat COVID-19, we realized that the OPD department had been virtually uh, you know, deserted and people were having problems going there just because they knew that um, those places had been designated as uh, COVID-19 cases. We also had cases in um, um, situations where um, uh, even antiretroviral drugs ran out. I, I must say that those situations have been rectified, um, um, uh, though. But the fact that uh, we lost sight of, the fa um, of some of these issues and we only were concentrating on COVID-19, but didn't see how we should integrate it in itself poses a lot of challenges. But I must say that some progress has been made in terms of the integration, but the, the, the critical point is that at this point in our life as a country, we will need to pay a lot more attention to primary health care, ensure that resources are devoted to um, um, implementing primary health care interventions. We are training a lot more um, health workers, especially doctors, so that in rural communities, we, we will have doctors there so that the disparity, the huge disparity, that exists between the, um, the urban and the rural areas, we will bridge it so that people who are suffering all forms of um, conditions um, which will make them susceptible to COVID-19 can have access to um, healthcare or the front, the, 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 the front line protection so that even in future, um, we cannot, even if we are able to resolve COVID-19, we cannot insulate ourselves from future pandemics, so long as we, are, we, we, we exist as a human, um, a human race, mm. pandemics will always be with us. The best protection, the best you know, uh, prepare, preparedness that we can ever have is to ensure that we have a functional primary health care system, and that requires a lot of investment in infrastructure, in human resource, and in motivating health workers to give up their best. Mm. Now, uh, we are joined now um, by Andrew Ayim, uh, who is uh, the Deputy Director of Policy, Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Division of the Ghana Health Service. Dr. Andrew Ayim, thank you very much for making the time to be with us on Zoom. We appreciate you. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about, yeah, I think you might have to unmute your, your, um, your microphone there so we can hear you. Um, now. It's been, what, uh, several decades since the Alma-Ata Declaration was signed in Kazakhstan. And uh, we all, all of those who signed to it, uh, agreed that we were going to make it a priority to ensure that uh, every person gets access to basic health care. Uh, and uh, not just basic health care, but preventive health care as well. How far has Ghana come since we signed on to that, um, that declaration all the way back in the 70s? Yes, I, I think we've, we've come very far from uh, where we started from. Because uh, at the time, you know, even in 1977, Ghana had already had a blueprint for the primary health care. And basically, in, uh, in Ghana, it's going to be made up the district hospitals, the health centers, and then the uh, CHIPS compounds. And, uh, so that in the community, there will be this network of primary and secondary healthcare, so that uh, because majority of the people live there, we, we strengthen the health system there. Then when we do that, we will see that the few that would have critical conditions would then move to the regional hospitals and then to the tertiary hospitals like Olibu. So that is the design. So for every community, 
uh, or for every district. We were hoping to have a district hospital and then a health the health center system and then the chips compound. Why this design uh, we, was that we knew that majority of people are usually not ill. About 95% of people are in town. It's only 5% of people who would need hospital care. The majority of them would need information and advice on how to live and how to uh, uh, manage their lifestyles so that at the end of the day, they would be able to uh, pre prevent uh, diseases, manage their health system, eat well, and therefore stay out of hospitals. So the hospital was not the mainstay of the primary health care, but it was the preventive aspects and the communication with the communities that was the main issue. For instance, if you take a disease like tuberculosis, we have the treatment, but then the important thing is that if the person is encouraged to take the drugs uh, monthly and all that, that and community encouragement is very critical. The other issue is that when you take the health centers and the CHIPS compounds, the communities have enough uh, resources if they come together to help and support the nurses to deliver health at that level. So that uh, the governments can come in at the higher levels with the more expensive uh, equipment and all that. So that's why I was happy when the previous speaker started off by saying that it's for all of us and we, we should all come together to uh, manage this primary health care system. And when you take the universal health coverage, which uh, Ghana, like he said, is embarking on and has done the roadmap, the primary health care is the backbone of that. And in it, we are defining our universal health coverage as all people living in Ghana to have timely access to high quality services, irrespective of their ability to pay at the point of use. And naturally, you notice that the national health insurance has also come in. Uh, they are improving their registration system so that more people have cards uh, to, to attend to their hospitals. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, the COVID had come in to also kind of derail some of the issues. But uh, I must say that in spite of the difficulties we had last year, we, uh, according to my uh, Director General's uh, speech for all of us in the uh, Ghana Health Service, uh, we realized that uh, we had made some gains as well. Uh, institutional maternal mortality ratio reduced by 8.8%, with Ashanti region recording the highest drop of uh, about 34% in 2020. And there was also an increase in antenatal registrants, and, and that was about 4% increase. And uh, Upper West uh, recorded the highest, which, which was about 9.53%. So with all these uh, gains, we are still uh, trying to in spite of the COVID, try to hold some of these positive aspects. In fact, our overall outpatient attendance decreased by 11%. If the greater Accra and Ashanti regions, which experienced the highest COVID burden, saw the highest decline in their OPD services. So all these issues are issues that going forward, we are coming back strongly to strengthen the health system, to come back with the essential services as well as managing the COVID as well in, in this 2021. Mm. Thank you. Right. Now, um, ob obviously, uh, we were talking earlier with uh, George about COVID-19 and the disruptive nature of it. Uh, how has that affected the delivery of primary health care in Ghana from the perspective of the Ghana Health Service? Yes, naturally, uh, it really affected uh, us because, uh, one, our health staff themselves were getting ill. So, naturally, our workforce... Mm came down and we had to deploy a lot of our workforces to activities of the COVID-19. And uh, you realize that uh, because of that, resources was also channeled towards the COVID-19. So routine services and access to health uh, kind of uh, suffered uh, in it. And that is uh, where uh, we realized that uh, decline in the completeness for most essential services. And, and that's what happened. And uh, every, every other thing was kind of channeled towards it. Now uh, we are having the vaccinations, we are working with the nurses, and so so many uh, uh, resources will be drawn from the central systems there. And that is why we are calling and we are joining St. Ghana to call on all Ghanaians to join, to support the CHIPS compounds, support the health centers, and to support the district hospitals in the best way they can to mm -hmm. uh, come back to where we used to be in spite of the COVID-19. Right, no doubt. I mean, you've outlined several challenges there. It seems it's not been an easy time since last year. But what has the state done about this? What has government done to mitigate, uh, you know, the, these effects of COVID-19? 
Yes, with a, a human resource. Uh, I mean, uh, now if you look at the number of training schools, uh, I think the medical schools have increased so much because I remember in our time there used to be three major universities, but now a lot of the universities are producing uh, medical uh, officers, and uh, almost every region also has uh, nursing training services, uh, uh, training schools. So basically the human resource issues are getting better, uh, except that uh, now sometimes we even overproduce and sometimes cannot take all of them up. But it's getting better now uh, with a country producing about almost 800 doctors a year. We believe that once we start getting everybody in uh, and, and training a lot more people in the new uh, uh, a pandemic uh, situation, we are going to get more uh, workforces. And now we are working with a lot more people because now what we are trying to do is to mobilize internal resources so that uh, if you look at the way COVID uh, uh, went, you saw that a lot of people came to help. A lot of people were buying PPEs for the hospitals. A lot of people were doing more. And we think we shouldn't stop and that we should continue so that if it's diabetes we, we, uh, that we are supporting, if it's hypertension that we are supporting, we can still buy equipment for the health centers and the covid uh, and the, uh, the, health, uh, the chips compounds so that hopefully we can all come up together in, in these times uh, of, of difficulty. Mm. Thank you. Now, the thing about uh, primary health care, of course, is that you, you need to really expand uh, the availability of services to uh, uh, those who need it the most. And it's not just about uh, neuromedical services, doctors and nurses, but therapists and so forth. Uh, now, this is a, a, a gap in our manpower situation, is it not? I mean, I, I, for example, uh, when it comes to people like nutritionists and dietitians, people who are needed to help with lifestyle diseases, podiatrists, I don't think I've ever encountered a single podiatrist on the payroll of Ghana Health Service. How are we blocking these uh, loopholes to ensure that we can provide a, a menu of services to those who need it the most? Yes, uh, you are very right. Uh, what we are experiencing uh, for us is a, is a good time because the private sector is coming in. So you realize that there, there are a lot more private uh, hospitals and private facilities coming to join. And according to my director general, uh, Dr. Patrick Abwadi, he's saying that we are going to even form networks of practice in various districts so that uh, private uh, sector can come together in an area uh, and, and support each other to deliver health. Because we realize that even though the payroll for the uh, government sector sometimes it's, it's not able to absorb so much. With the expansion of the private sector, a lot is going to happen. And we are going to build a lot of networks uh, with even uh, market uh, clinics and any other clinics that come up so that that network would share resources and leverage resources uh, to cater for the people around there. And we are, we are trying to do that. Uh, in fact, now when you go to Accra, some of the places, you realize that we are doing even urban chips where some of the uh, clinics are not big hospitals, but kind of container systems were linked to hospitals and uh, the nurses are going in, and in there to support people. So we are trying to look at the network system where resources can be leveraged and then we, we can uh, reach out to more people like yeah. you are saying. Let me, bring, uh, let me bring George back in here. Um, uh, primary health care is not just about um, you know, um, physical health. There's social health, there's mental health. Uh, how is Ghana doing in these areas and what, what in particular is SEND Ghana uh, hoping to achieve? Are there any targets to improve primary health care in the areas of mental health, uh, social health as well? Well, well but, but, you know, I think that um, we seem to have concentrated on the aspect that is uh, supposed to be handled by the Ghana Health Service and they are doing their best within the uh, constraints that they find themselves. But, but you know, you will know, for example, that nobody is paying attention to the fact that when you go to some restaurant, you get your banku served in, you know, served hot in that rubber. That we know that it has a lot of health implications. But why is it that nobody is taking action? We want to, we, we you know, we want to get the carcinogenic materials into people's system for mm. people to have cancers before we put pressure on the, you know, limited health. Uh, uh, health, health, health uh, 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 system. That is one. We, with the issue of sanitation, it's a big issue. The issues of sanitation. But though the social aspect is that we have problem with unemployment. Social pressures in this country, they all affect people's well-being and health conditions. If we want to talk about primary health care, 
and we only concentrate on the you know the curative side and then the palliative side and probably a little bit on the promotion and we don't look at the environmental economic and then the the the, 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 the social side of it the effort that the Ghana Health Service, for example, is putting in place probably will not yield the needed result. So I think that it calls for an integrated planning and programming approach, as well as implementation approach. This means that institutional coordination and institutional collaboration is very important. We cannot leave health issue to only Ghana Health Service or the uh, Ministry of health, uh, health alone. I mean, for example, you cannot make COVID-19 only a Ghana Health Service case alone. You need a lot more people to play different roles. So to, to even safeguard our environment, we need the Environmental Protection uh, uh, um, Agency to do their work. We need some people to, to have the political courage to say that we ban um, politics back, those that are indiscriminately you know, disposed of in the environment. Look at when it rains. We create all of these problems and that doesn't promote primary health care. And when we allow all sort of food to be eaten, I mean, somebody needs to regulate how food is even served in this country. What goes into that? What is the inspector division um, doing in terms of visiting restaurants to check whether what um, people are consuming wholesome you know, food ingredients so that we don't wait for disease to uh, I mean, uh, um, you know, if you like catch people mm. for, 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 for the stress to be exerted on the, you know, limited infrastructure, health infrastructure that we have, or the health workers. When you go to some of the health facilities, you see stress on the faces of the health workers. And sometimes we vent our anger on them, forgetting that the system is actually stressing them. We will need to address all of these interconnected issues so, so as to achieve uh, primary health care um, in, in its comprehensive nature as we, we, we look at it. At the moment, it seems to mean that we are only uh, pursuing aspects of primary health care. When we don't um, look at all of this, the social, and environmental, and then even the economic dimension, we, uh, we, we will not be able to, you know, um, safeguard well-being where so as to promote, uh, you know, uh, 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 the health of the, of the people. And I think that we need to pay attention to these areas and that means that we have to take some lessons from um from what COVID-19 has taught us and he made out of this pandemic with the result to invest in and it all all of these problems are happening because we are not investing as much as we should be investing in in, in primary health care and, and, and I think that we will need to make a choice as a country where whether we want to promote the health and the well-being of the people, or we want to, uh, you know, tackle it in, in, in the way that we are doing. And I think that we cannot afford to um, suffer another effect of pandemic, I mean, future pandemic in, in, in this way. And it requires the, the planning house to start right now and the political commitment to devote resources to financing primary health care has to start right now. And I want that, the, the, the other thing that I want to say is that in as much as I am, I agree with Dr. Ayim that um, these days we are having more, uh, you know, universities training um, medical officers. I think we can even democratize it further. I am aware that, for example, uh, some of these medical officers that we get from um, Cuba, some of them are trained in polyclinics. Poly so do we want to continue with that, of course, compromising on the quality? Do we want to continue, you know, focusing on you know, training at only tertiary institutions when we can be innovative about it to, so that we can democratize it. One of the things is, that is also worrying is that even medical education is becoming increasingly expensive for people who cannot afford it. Government is paying for some people, but um, for some of these new facilities, what they charge, it can be very atrocious. And, uh, 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 and so um, we will need to figure out how we democratize it in a way that we can get a lot more young people who are so desirous to serve this country in 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 in, 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 the, in, in medical capacity to, to 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 fulfill their dreams and that is how um, i mean too much can never be enough too much mm. medical officers can never be enough we can even begin to export them if we think we have too much but for the at the moment to have a doctor 
uh, population ratio of about thousand, thousand, uh, thousand um, and eight thereabouts, or I mean, according to 2017 figure, about thousand eight and uh, forty, uh, four hundred or so. Um, we can't, we can't, we can't be serious um, about you know achieving the uh, the comprehensive objective of primary health care if we go about it in, in this slow uh, pace. Mm. All right, so here's how I'd like us to wrap up, and I'll give a, each of you a minute or two to do this. So I'll start with Andrew. Uh, look, very often when we, when we have these conversations, at the end of it, we're calling on government, we're calling on institutions, we're calling on CSOs. Today, let's flip the script a little bit. Let's call on the people of Ghana, those who are sitting in their living rooms, dining rooms, waiting rooms, front rooms, back rooms. Let's talk to them. Let's tell them what they need to do to ensure that primary health care in Ghana is, uh, you know, used to its optimum best and that they themselves can support the promotion of uh, primary health care delivery across the country. Andrew, Andrew, would you like to start, please? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I think it's important to uh, make note that the national health policy, which was launched last year, had as its main objective, just one. Uh, the first one is to strengthen the health care delivery system to be resilient. That's the first one. But all the uh, other four, which is to encourage the adoption of healthy lifestyles, to improve the physical environment, to improve the socioeconomic status of the population and to ensure sustainable financing is a part that the whole community can embrace. Because uh, when it comes to healthy lifestyles, it's, a, it's something that the, your neighbor can tell you uh, whether you are uh, living well or you are not living well, whether you are overindulging or you are not uh, overindulging. And we realize that too many people are overindulging and very little physical exercises are being done by a lot of people. And we would encourage that at a personal level, that issue comes up. And then decision to take people to hospital. Sometimes, unfortunately, in Ghana, what I will, I will beg a lot of the population to do is that when somebody is in trouble, let's say a woman is in labor or is bleeding, that's not the time the transport system should charge or overcharge the person. That's the time that we should either charge the normal rate or even charge lower. And as we help each other, uh, the community gets better and we will get better. And for those who have a, a little bit more resources, we believe that pushing back some into the healthcare system of your community, of your hometown, and of your uh, uh, where you stay will be very, very important. And when it comes to sanitation, we would encourage everybody to do the best you can within your area to prevent the water bodies from being contaminated. Because when they run into the waterworks system and it is pumped back into our pipes, that's where we get a lot more diseases. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, let's uh, quickly hear uh, concluding remarks. Same issue, George. Uh, how, what would your message be to the public? Yes, uh, I couldn't agree with Andrew more, but I just want to add that since we agree that primary health care is a whole society approach, it means that the responsibility does not only rest on government. In our communities, for example, at the level, at the base, very basic, how uh, um, it is very important that community members take responsibility for their health needs. And so their involvement in health planning is very important. Their involvement in monitoring uh, quality of services there is very important. Their uh, involvement in, um, you, know, pro, you know, more or less promoting what we, eat, what we grow in our own environment, rather than relying on all of these, you know, mushrooming um, fast, fast food joints, and we think that it is associated with some prestige, but it actually, it is associated, we are cutting diseases into our system. We will need to educate ourselves and disabuse our minds of all of these so-called exotic lifestyles so that we can promote healthy lifestyle. We, we, we also we, we need to look at, as citizens, when we are calling for huge investment into uh, primary health care, it also then uh, means that we have to fulfill our obligation in terms of paying our taxes, in terms of promoting accountable uses or ac accountable use of public resources, so that um, we don't defend anything um, because we are either politically affiliated to an institution or individual, or we are ethnically related to somebody. And I think that if we can protect the public first from our own individual perspective, we will then free resources that could be used to, uh, you know, uh, channel into primary primary health care. That is very important. And I think that we will need to be serious about certain things. We have passed laws to ban uh, public smoking in this country. People do this with impunity. 
people don't take responsibility. And I think that in as much as we may have weaknesses in terms of enforcing it, uh, bar owners, um, you know, people who manage public places will have to take responsibility and enforce such laws. Because if one person is smoking, that person is not only cutting disease for himself, but for whoever is around. And if we will look at it in that regard, it will be very important. Um, our environment, um, some people, sometimes I stop some cars and I get them to say, I mean, get, the, uh, get the driver to, you know, get down to, uh, to get somebody who might have thrown something out. And you get insult instead of getting the public to support you to keep the environment clean. The issue of uh, protecting our environment is very important. That I'm saying, the, the danger that is causing to our water bodies, people are drinking mercury into their system. We will need to have green. We are building half a We are not living, you know, in a green spot in Accra, for example. How do we get fresh air if we are doing all of this? We will need to begin to take this issue of primary health care as a serious uh, issue. That, that is not only a matter of hospital, it's not a matter for doctors to handle. But it's not only a matter for doctors. Doctors will only come in if we don't do the needful. To, uh, uh, for, for, that's, when, that, that's the only point that they, they, they come in. And if we see it as a life course issue that has got to do with everything that we do, that is when we'll begin to make progress. And a lot of the responsibility rests on us as citizens to, to, you know, to, to act and to protect our environment, to pay our taxes, and to make sure that resources that are being used, whether infrastructure, health infrastructure that is being provided in our community, uh, contractors are doing a good job in a way that will cause savings to government so that they don't just leave, they do a nature job and leave it. At the end of the day, we, the citizens in those communities, will suffer the effect if our health systems are not working. George Bimpe is country director for Send Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much, George, for your time. Also, thanks to uh, Dr. Andrew Yim, uh, who joined us via Zoom as well. He's the deputy director of policy, policy planning, monitoring and evaluation division at the Ghana Health Service. Thank you both very, very much. Let's stay on health. The establishment of a national quality assurance program for COVID-19 testing labs, uh, the first of its kind in Ghana, has raised the cutoff point for labs during COVID-19 testing to 80%. This is to enforce adherence to safety and quality assurance protocols within COVID-19 testing labs as part of the National Quality Assurance Program for PCR testing and guarantee the accuracy of COVID-19 test results, uh, irrespective of which accredited lab conducted the test. Now, this program, launched in November last year by the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service, has been implemented by partners including the National Laboratory Network for COVID-19 Testing, Food and Drugs Authority, Health Facilities Regulatory Agency, HEFRA, and with support from Farm Access Foundation. A critical component of the National Quality Assurance Program has been the assessment, technical support and monitoring of the 23 accredited COVID-19 PCR testing labs across the nation to ensure that they have the required human um, pro the required protocols, forgive us, and the required human resources, and use standardized equipment to conduct the tests. Here's coordinator for the National Laboratory Network for COVID-19, Professor William Kwabana Ampofu, at a presentation to the program team. The data, as we presented uh, today to, to the main group, well, was very interesting. You know, some labs scored 100%, some labs scored, you know, less than 70%. And this is of great concern. Uh, because, let me explain a bit on that. When you test for a pathogen, if it is negative, it is negative. If, it is, if you get a false negative result, which means that the pathogen is there, but your result says it's negative, that's a problem for COVID. People will be walking around with a false negative result, but they're actually positive and they're spreading the infection. Our main aim with the pandemic is to block the transmission you know, uh, that's why we quarantine people, okay? That's why we, we, we try and prevent the infection. That's why we're getting the vaccine right now. So for the testing lab for PCR, false negative is an issue. And we have found false negatives, you know, being presented uh, in, in the network. So in the discussion today, we have decided that if you are a lab, you must get at least 80%, you know, and it should not be a false negative. That means that any sample that is positive, you must pick it up as truly a positive sample. If you find somebody 
who is negative and you make a mistake and you declare him as positive. Worst case scenario, you know, the guy will not travel. <laughs> you stay at home for two weeks. However, that is not um, a major issue because usually when people are declared positive, sometimes they go test again. So if you do a couple of tests and you, are, you don't have any symptoms, it will be clear that an error was made and you are truly negative. But if you are positive and you declare as negative, sit in a plane, you go to Dubai and then, hmm, in fact, in some jurisdictions, if the airline boards a passenger who is positive, some of the airlines have been fined, they have been banned from, you know, flying to those countries and there have been serious issues that, you know, have come up. So, Professor William Ampofo speaking there. Now, member of the National Laboratory Network for COVID-19 Testing, Professor Richard Phillips, who is also the director of the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research, KCCR, has been addressing the issue of challenges with data handling, which requires attention. You need to know is the, the reason why your result was negative. Do you have positive controls? Do you have negative controls? Every time you run your PCR, you should put in a positive control and a negative control. At the end of the run, your positive should be positive and your negative control should be negative before you even start interpreting your patient results. If one of them does not work, discard it and start it all over again. If you go into a lab that glosses over that, it's going to issue a wrong result. And so these are some of the things that we had to provide a sort of training to ensure that the, the, the bar is very high for the testing. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Netherlands government has commended the government of Ghana for the forthrightness in dealing with the pandemic since its outbreak in the country. Uh, the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency Ambassador Ron Stricker, has praised the Ghanaian government for showing strong political will and taking very timely decisions in the interest of safety and well-being of Ghanaian citizens. Uh, Ghana has now quality standards with regard to um, coming to test results in laboratories because um, you have now quality standards, you have uniformity, and you have therefore also the same protocols, of course. Then the second um, uh, result, and that was also a goal of the project, is that you have to ensure that these things which have been, the standards which have been obtained in a couple of months only, will be maintained after this particular project has ended. So what you have done is that you have created or strengthened capacity at two regulators, that is the Food and Drug Agency, no thank you, thank you, and the National um, Health Facilities Regulatory Body, no it is the Health Facilities Regulatory Agency, so that they can look after the enforcement of the standards, uniform, uniformity and the protocol after the project has ended. Yes. Then the third element is that um, you have now good um, quality standards for test results, which of course is an enormous uh, achievement, but uh, you want also to ensure that the data from these tests um, are inserted, of course, in the system and then are um, quickly available to all um, major partners or basically crucial partners in the system, including the Ministry of Health, of course, and the Ghana Health Service. So that you, you have reliability of test results, but you have them also quickly available. So you put them together. So that, that, that's basically, is that what it is all about? Exactly. That's all, uh, what it is all about. His Excellency Ron Stricker of the Netherlands Embassy. Now, let's go to our partners at uh, DW Television. Now, this week's big topic from there is the decision by various European countries, including Germany, to suspend the use of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine as a precautionary measure after reports of thrombosis in some who have been inoculated. It's still unclear how long the suspension will last, but a decision is expected later this week after European medical experts clear up questions over the vaccine's safety. 
Uh, will this end up being a topic for us in Ghana this week? Thomas Sparrow from DW joined us. Uh, Thomas, it's good to see you. Uh, can you first of all explain why exactly Germany and other European countries have decided to temporarily stop using the AstraZeneca vaccine? Germany and other countries like Italy, France and Spain halted the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine this week as a precautionary measure because of the possibility of blood clots. In Germany, seven cases were reported where a blood clot had occurred after someone had received a vaccine. This is a rare occurrence compared to the 1.6 million AstraZeneca doses that have been administered. But it's one that nevertheless has to be thoroughly investigated. And that's why politicians decided to err on the side of medical caution until a study at a European level can give concrete answers as to whether the clots are a coincidence or are related to the vaccine. The government here defended the halt, but other politicians and epidemiologists were critical of it, saying it was a mistake and the vaccine's benefits outweigh the risks. Fascinating. Now, what exactly does this mean? for the introduction of vaccination in Germany. Is this a, a big setback? Well, it is an initial setback because it creates uncertainty about a vaccination program which is already under fire for being very slow. There are questions now about what it means for the 1.4 million AstraZeneca vaccine doses which have been delivered to Germany but haven't been used. There are also questions about how to proceed with patients who have received a first AstraZeneca jab but are waiting for the second one. And there are questions about what this suspension means for Germany's goal to offer every adult a coronavirus vaccine by the end of the summer, so in around six months. It's important to stress that over 8% of Germans have received a first coronavirus vaccine, which is less than other countries both inside and outside the EU. Still a very long way to go for the people of Germany in completing this goal by summer. But how do people react? Can this actually affect confidence in the vaccine and the vaccination program? There is a degree of insecurity surrounding the safety of AstraZeneca and what it all means for Germany. And that's why it's so important for authorities now to focus more and more on building trust. A new survey this week revealed that a majority of Germans say it was a responsible decision to halt the use of AstraZeneca, whereas 39% said it was exaggerated. And a vast majority, 88%, think Germany's vaccination program is going badly or very badly. This essentially means that authorities have a lot of work to do to improve the current situation here in Germany. Mark, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, that's our colleague Mark Sparrow from DWTV. Now, uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back... Look, land disputes are not easy. Imagine battling your fellow Ghanaian over a piece of land. Now, if that's not bad enough, imagine battling the military over a piece of land that the president has given to you. That's the reality for the people of land. When we come back, we'll be speaking to a queen mother who will tell us what they intend to do about it. Welcome back. Now, the Lands and Natural Resources Minister, Samuel Abu Jinapo, has vowed to carry through President Akufuado's resolve to deal with land disputes in Accra and other parts of the country. It follows mounting tension between the youth of La here in Accra and the Ghana Armed Forces over a 250-acre parcel of land at Airport Hills. Yesterday, the youth, led by the traditional leaders, stormed the Lands Commission headquarters to demand the release of documents to the lands they say has been released to them by government. Now, in the studio today, we're going to speak to officials of the Gadangme Lands Administration, the body that is seeking to harmonize land management in Ghana, working with the Lands Commission. First, though, let's bring you that report from the Airport Hills area where the youth of La demanded the release of a parcel of land that they said had been unlawfully occupied by the military. Sounds of some angry youth of La registering their displeasure over what they describe as a military invasion of their lands, holding placards with inscriptions, military thieves, give us back our lands, among others, they march from the La traditional council to the newly constructed La military cemetery at Bema camp. <laughs> the gods of the land were then invoked 
to punish those unlawfully taking their lands. The Coalition of La Association, the umbrella body of youth groups there, say the parcel of land in contention was leased to the government in 1953 to serve as Gafford camp for soldiers after the World War. The lease they claim expired in 1963, but to date, the military has failed to give them back their lands. Jeffrey Tete is spokesperson for the group. We have realized that the military on their own have now extended and they keep extending the portions of land that was given to them. They were given just 23.7 acres. Now look at what they have taken. It's beyond 6,000 acres. Military has now sold some of the lands. When they are not supposed to be dealing in land, they are supposed to be utilizing it for the purpose of military. Okay. So today we are saying that the La Township has expanded and grown. And all we want is that we need to open up our space and come to this portion of our land. Military is preventing us. And for your information, this particular portion of land that you see has not actually been acquired. What happened was that they proposed to acquire. So there are documents which says that proposed acquisition, but the acquisition has not been done. So why are the military forcing and trying to take it by force? Now what they have done is that they have brutalized our farmers, they have beaten our kinsmen, they have done a whole lot of illegality against us. We know the military to be a disciplined institution. Now military has become so indisciplined that even when the government speaks, they don't want to listen to the same government that is directing them. So what are we saying? Now you can imagine, all from here, down to Laboma Beach, to the Southern Command, those lands are, are for the La people. Military said they are not going to allow the La people to occupy and possess their land. Where in this world will you see this happening? They want government to hand over documentation of the land to the stool, coupled with an authorization to reclaim the lands. The promise that was made on 27th of November, that this land has been given to the people of La. They should append their signatures to the document, grant all documentation to the stool to the occupants of the stool, that's the traditional council and all those people, so that the people of La will be able to benefit for, from their heritage. Otherwise, like we have done today, we have invoked the gods, gods, the 99 gods of La, we have invoked them so that they will take action. And we know the almighty God is also solidly behind us. They claim the Lands Commission is in bed with the military, given the military false documents of ownership. <laughs> the angry youth then stormed the Lands Commission, demanding an audience with the Lands Minister, who was on a working visit. Soon, the police were invited. They tried reasoning with the leaders of the group to no avail. <laughs> Finally, the Lands Minister came out, assuring leaders of the group their concerns will be addressed. Little did I know that I'll be accosted the way you've accosted me. But what I can say to you is that let us all exercise restraint, let us all be patient, and let us all act in accordance with the law, and let us all respect public order in our country. And the assurance I can give to you and to the chiefs and to the people of Greater Accra and to the, and to the, and to the people of La and, and, the, and the Ga community in Greater Accra is that the president said it before the elections and is very committed to ensure that this age-old uh, difficult controversial issues of land administration in Accra are dealt with substantially and we intend to do that. A promised leadership of the coalition holds dear. For now, they leave chanting songs of hope. For Sina Safo, for Joe News. The Ghana Armed Forces have declined our request for a comment on this matter. And as you heard there, the Lands Minister, Samuel Abu Jinapur, has been assuring uh, the people of his desire to deal with that matter. That engagement uh, has started, and uh, we'll bring you details uh, as that continues. But first, let's speak to my guest, Na Bole Wulu II, who is the divisional queen mother of Sakumono. Uh, she's also the vice chairman of the GDLA, uh, NAA, right? Uh, uh, actually, GDLA. 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 Uh, um, uh, we're happy to speak to you. Uh, thank you very much for making the time. Mm. Uh, you are unhappy about the fact that there are so many land litigation mm. issues in Ghana. T tell us, how big is the problem? Mm. Um, I greet all um, your listeners and your viewers at this moment, uh, permit me to speak my language for a little time at least to let them know what it's all about. Um, okay, so back to your question. 
the problem at stake is really, really big. We have um, a lot of lands which has been taken away from us from, uh, by the government. Others has been acquired. I, I am, um, uh, my Sakumono is a typical example of what I'm about to say. Uh, where we have um, uh, land which has been acquired by the government for harbor extension. And as we speak now, the harbor terminal three has been built, but yet we don't see our SS land. And it's really a very big land, a vast land. So um, I think it's the same thing going on here in La. And uh, we are all rising against this thing. We are begging everybody, the encroachers, the government, the, the uh, ministers, the police, the, anybody who has uh, uh, encroached on any God Dangbe land, we are speaking for them to leave or give back our lands. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why GDLA has come. GDLA has come and has really come to stay. Um, it is there to take care of issues like this. You know, land litigations, problems with chieftaincy affairs, where there are two chiefs, two queens and all that. This is why uh, GDLA is there. So uh, I appeal to my fellow um, Gadangbe or Gans that yes, this is the problem. We are all suffering it. We are all really, really serious. In fact, I, I for one, I have a very big problem when it comes to this whole thing. But uh, I appeal to them to just come to the offices of the GDLA because GDLA is there to serve Gadangbe. Gadangbe lands and administration. So they should come and join us. We are trying to unite ourselves to fight. So they shouldn't just go out and be moving around foreign libation. Yes, it's good. Of course, it's good. It tells how serious the situation is and how serious we want back our lands because this whole thing, you can't see it anywhere except on Gadangbe lands. And we are really, really mad about this. Mm. So uh, tell us about what you've done so far. I mean, uh, have you engaged uh, the state um, uh, or any of the you know, parties to these disputes? Yes, uh, GDLA has written to the office of the president, uh, to the government, to most of the offices where land issues are being solved or where the power lies. So uh, we are looking forward for an appointment where we can go and sit, talk to them, let them know what we feel and how we feel. Probably they may see reasons with us and then give us back our land. If not, then we are going to come together. I'm talking about the whole Gatangbe and fight. I urge my fellow Gadangbe. When you say fight, what do you mean exactly? Yes, I say fight because this is, is more of a battle. You see my fellow uh, men and women, you know, out there displaying and all, yes, part of it. It's not just a, you, you saw where a policeman is dragging somebody, so it's a war time. So that's what you mean you will do, that you will come together and uh, no, I don't. Violence? I, no, no, I don't mean I am. We are coming together to to bring out things like this. You could realize I started by saying that they should come and join GDLA. They should bring their problems to us. This is why GDLA is there to take care of land litigations. You are a guy at Dangbe, and then a, a, a stranger is taking your land away from you. A land which belongs to a whole clan, one person is taking it away from the whole family. You have a, a family house where one person has woken up to break the whole place. This is why GDLA is there. Where uh, there are two queen mothers, two chiefs, three chiefs, where there are, you know, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but fight. Mm. Yes. So uh, this is why we are there. And I'm using this platform to tell everybody out there looking at me right now, that GDLA is not far from you. Mm. It's located at Chado. Chado last stop. 
So um, don't sit at home and be fighting alone. You cannot do it alone. Mm. This is pen and paper. We are talking about book. So you can't, you can't be going around like this. We fight with book. We fight with pen and paper, with brain. Not with uh, uh, woods and other things. Right. So uh, um, how much engagement have you had with the people in this particular story we dealt with, the la lands issue at Chadu? Uh, how much engagement has your organization had in that issue? This case has actually just got into our table, or our decks, and then uh, we are trying our best to get in touch with them, hold them, educate them, make them understand why we need to unite why we need to come together as Ga Adangbe and fight this battle. If I say fight, like I still say, yeah. it's about pen and paper, not with gun, mm. not with cutlass, not with uh, knives, but I'm talking about pen and paper. That is why the courts are there. So they should come. Yes. Mm. Why, why, why do you think these problems are, are so widespread? I mean, you've told us already that it's a big problem. So, so why? Why do you think it's getting so bad? I mean, we have courts, like you said. Yeah. We have laws. We have lands commission. We have all kinds of institutions that are supposed to you know, make things easy. There is one way, one correct way of buying land or acquiring land. Why? Why are we still having all these problems? Okay, um, from my own side, um, I will say these things with the way it stands. Eh? The government acquired the land for harbor extension. Later, okay, uh, the harbor has been built. Excess land is very vast. Give it back to the owners and it's not being returned. Now, the land in question has gotten to uh, TDC. TDC has given it to Forestry Commission. And Forestry Commission is saying that the land belongs to them. Meanwhile, there are no uh, animals, there are no uh, tigers, there are no lions there. They say it's for Forestry Commission. But yet we see people building there. So if it's for the government, or if it's for Forestry Commission, how did these people got access to build there? And this is what will provoke someone like me to go forward. And going to find out what, why the person is building or what documents does the person have to build is going to generate a whole lot of problems. Mm. Okay, so it is, this, this is so simple. We are saying that our land, which has been taken by the government, with all due respect, we need our land back. Because we have nowhere sleeping. We have God who are sleeping along the street. We have people, you know, nowhere. And we have more strangers in the town building and renting it to Gadangbe's on our own land. And it's very serious. Mm. Okay, so this is the problem. We are just begging the government through GDLA for the government to see reasons to give us back our lands. Mm. So, People who are looking at me through this uh, medium should come to GDLA so we can together fight. Right, and you'll find them at Chadu. Now we'll do the second yeah, is uh, Divisional Queen Mother for Sakumono. Yes. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Now, let's move on to some other stories. A nine-year-old boy has been killed in an inferno after his stepfather set their home ablaze at Medio Medoma in the Ashanti region. Uh, the blaze swept through four rooms in the apartment in which they lived, uh, affecting other families. Uh, the man, known only as Ajiman, his wife and the twin brother of the deceased, uh, sustained various degrees of injuries. Uh, Nanai Ajima has been learning more uh, after he visited the scene and filed this report. The nine-year-old boy, Prince Oti Atta, is said to have shown great potential in drawing. He is described as a bubbly kid. The stepfather is said to have repeatedly assaulted his wife and the twins. Landlord Daniel Opoku narrates what happened the night before the incident. 
I met his wife immediately I entered the house that night. She pleaded with me to speak to her husband about a phone her brother bought for her. I called him and advised him against repeated assaults of the woman. Mr. Opoku says deep into the night he heard a loud cry for help, which caused him to wake up. She told me her husband had fled after starting the fire. He had locked the burglar proof. But I managed to save the woman and the girl. The woman told me the man had wet a blanket with petrol and thrown it on the boy through the window. Firefighters, after extinguishing the fire, recovered the charred body of the victim and deposited it at the morgue. Other families occupying the house managed to escape unhurt, but they lost all their property to the inferno with no hope of a place to pass the night. She says, the noise made me come out and I saw smoke everywhere. All I could do was to pick my son. The cause of the man's action remains unclear. He is receiving treatment at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital and the police watch. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. Tragic, tragic story there. Uh, this is the polls. And um, Ghana Institution of Engineers uh, are going to crack down on quacks in the industry. The Ghana Institution uh, of Engineers has announced a clampdown on quack engineers as it begins implementation of its newly passed legislative instrument. Incoming president, engineer Professor Reverend Charles Adams, says the institution is mobilizing other crafts under its umbrella to promote quality standards in the industry. Now, he was speaking at a press conference to announce the institution's upcoming 51st annual general meeting and conference. Love FM Zirasa Sasari Donko was there. Here's his report. At the peak of extreme dust pollution on the lake road in Kumase, the question of best road engineering practices come into focus. While some contractors adopt prudent ways to minimize environmental pollution, others contribute to harsh situations for residents. Here, the contractor decides to keep the asphalt because there are settlements here and he wants to minimize dust pollution. To the layman, this is good engineering. But to the other side, from Atonso Agogo and beyond, belongs to a different contractor altogether, Kofi Job Construction. Now, when you look at the dust pollution in that area, it's caused by the total removal of the asphalt whilst the road is still under construction, which is causing extreme dust pollution to residents there. Incoming president of the Ghana Institution of Engineers, engineer professor Reverend Charles Adams, attributes the situation to lack of financing. And depending on the cash flow situation, when you don't have the finance or the this thing, what you are planning, you may not be able to implement it as you would have wished. But I want to plead with the road agencies responsible that even if you have not been paid, and the thing has been ripped off and is creating dust, the least he can do is to water the road to ensure that businesses can continue in the corridor. The role of engineers in ensuring quality road engineering has been brought to the fore as the Ghana Institution of Engineers prepares to host its 51st annual general meeting and conference in Kumasi. The theme is engineering, a key to sustainable development. 
chairman of the local organizing committee, engineer Nana Pukwajiman, says engineers will deliberate on ways to contribute to national development. He spoke about a crackdown on quack engineers. We have specification for the Ministry of Roads and Highways, so we try as much as possible to adhere. Of course, there might be recalcitrant engineers, and now that we have a legislative instrument, we are going to penalize people who are parading themselves as engineers, but who do not have the professional certification. Some roads constructed barely a year ago have started deteriorating. Engineer Nanapu Kwajiman, who is the Kumase Urban Roads Director, gives possible reasons for the unfortunate situation. You see probably people washing vehicles on the carriageway. So the combination, the chemical combination of uh, the soap, the chemicals and water seeps. And the number one enemy of uh, the road is water. We expect that we all protect the road. But you see mechanics on the road change, and these are things I've always written to the city authorities. We need to make sure that we told them, and even surcharge them, so that it serves as a deterrent to others. The 51st AGM and conference of the Ghana Institution of Engineers will promote the role of engineers in ensuring sustainable development in the country. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko, Kumasi. Now let's catch up with the drama in Parliament as Majority Leader Oseche Min Sabunsu has reacted to uh, Speaker Alban Bagbin's threats to block the approval of the budget. He says the Speaker does not have the powers or the authority to block the approval. He further indicates that the Speaker shouldn't have gone public with his rants. However, he agrees that the communication from uh, Nana Asante Bidhi to the President's Executive Secretary was wrongly worded. Uh, here is uh, Kwesi Parker Wilson joining us via Zoom for a little bit more. Right, uh, Kwesi, I hope you can hear me. Let's, uh, let's see if we can reconnect with Kwesi Parker Wilson, who joins us via Zoom in Parliament. Uh, Kwesi, if you can hear me. Yes, could yes, you? Wonderful. I can, uh, Tell us the latest. I can hear you loud and clear. All right, so um, since yesterday, I mean, the country was actually thrown into shock when the Speaker of Parliament, Avan Babin, uh, issued a threat to hide the approval and mainly because there was a communication from the office of the president signed by the, the president executive secretary Nana Asante Bediakiu that government has revised the budget estimate for members of parliament and also the judiciary which the speaker deemed the communication as inappropriate because the presidency does not have the powers to review or revise the budget estimate for members of parliament or parliament and also the judiciary. And so he indicated that he has written a letter to the presidency uh, that they do not have the powers to do that and asked the committee in charge to rather go back and look at the budget estimate, uh, get an appropriate one so that they can now forward it to the president. And again, he made the point that parliament should be treated as a ministry or an agency uh, where they have to submit their budget estimate to the Ministry of Finance. Now, getting a reaction or response from the majority leader who, of course, delivered the budget on last week, Friday, and the point he made was that the article the speaker cited, and that scared me a bit, uh, Kujo, uh, the speaker backed his argument with, with would, would. Right, um, Kwesi, I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, let's go live now to the chamber. Um, right, um, the first deputy speaker appears to be uh, making some remarks right now. Right, uh, Kwesi, uh, do we have you? Right, uh, let's see if we can reconnect. Yeah, I'm, with... I'm still here, Kojo. Wonderful. Okay, so you were making a point. Uh, I missed the last part of it. Right, okay, I think we've lost Okay, that. so the point I was making was that the argument of the Constitution... No, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so so I'm saying that the argument as one by the majority leader is that the uh, portions of the constitution which the speaker cited to back his defense um, does not apply to parliament, but rather it only applies to the judiciary. So in effect, the speaker misinterpreted the that particular provision in the constitution. Again, uh, he claims that the speaker does not even have the power to even block the approval of, of the budget because uh, normally when parliament decides to approve a budget of the government, uh, it goes to the clerk of parliament, they sign and they forward it to the presidency. And particularly when the speaker of parliament is not a member of parliament, it would be very difficult for him to even make any attempt to block the approval of the budget. And, 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 and finally, uh, he makes the point that, well, the, the wording, if, if you look at the communication, the wording was a bit inappropriate. Uh, and that, that is what got the Speaker of Parliament in sense, reason uh, he decided to say the things that he said. But he believes that in spite of meeting, the Speaker shouldn't have gone. There has been a background conversation discussion going on between the presidency and the speaker and the and parliament uh, which he or such chairman supposed to represent as the majority leader and so uh, the president has indicated that they cannot meet your budget because in the basket we cannot afford what we don't have and so if we are having a conversation with you on that and you're still not happy with it it is only proper and prudent to channel your grievances to the appropriate quarters and not to come to the chamber to raise concerns about what's been happening closed door. He ever tells me that, well, after the directive of the Speaker of Parliament, he has to reach out to the, the president, uh, who is now currently in La Côte d'Ivoire, and the information he has gotten is that, well, there is nothing they can do about it for now, uh, because they cannot spend outside their budget. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they have to cut down on a number of budget estimates for uh, the various ministries. Right, uh, Chris Parker Wilson there, our correspondent from uh, Parliament. And uh, of course, there'll be more on this and other stories from the House of Representatives. Right now, though, Assembly member for Ahimfie Electoral Area in the Winchi municipality of the Bono region, Kasim Mohammed, has expressed disgust at the activities of cattle herdsmen at the SDA cluster of schools in the area. Now, according to him, the constant nuisance by the cattle in the school has been disrupting classroom work intermittently. Kasim Mohammed, who doubles as a member of the school management committee, was speaking to Joy News' Nesta Kafui Ajuma in Wenchi. This is Wenchi SDA cluster of schools in the Bono region, popularly known as Frima School. It can boast of producing most of the top-class citizens of Wenchi and its surrounding communities, but it is grappling with the incessant invasion of the compound by cattle. Headsmen bring their animals here every day to graze, even during lesson hours, causing panic among school children. Assembly member for the Ahimfie electoral area, Kasim Mohammed, says efforts to halt the activities of headsmen and the cattle in the school have failed due to the hostility of the headsmen. He believes only a fence wall can fix the challenge. I'm the honorable member for this electoral area, and this is the only school situated in my electoral area. Honestly, the cattle has been grazing here for a long time. They've turned this place as the place for, for, for grazing. Now, when you, when you turn your back and see what is going on in the school, it's nothing good to write home about. We are entreating everybody, the school management, the SMC, the headmasters, we are entreating everybody, our MP, the chief executive for Fuenchi, and all the people across the diaspora. We are entreating them to come to our aid, to fight, to let us fight this menace. This is the canker that we are facing in Wenchi. We want the school to be fenced. We want them to help us fence the school. You see, if the school is not fenced, you see, we have little, little children coming to school here. 
and now if they come and unfortunately for them if some of them even come outside to play and then unfortunately for them if some of these cattle get them knocked down and now it will be very 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 a uh, big problem for us this thing is giving us a very serious headache so we are entreating everybody to come on board help us to fight this menace even though the teachers decline to speak on camera they concede the invasion of the school's premises by the cattle has been the greatest setback on effective teaching and learning. They say the only permanent remedy to the cattle nuisance is construction of a fence wall. Nesta Kafui Ajuma reporting. So, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, the, uh, the back and forth between the Audit General and the Audit Service Board continues. Uh, this time, it's, go it's gone to the paper as uh, some correspondence flying back and forth between the two of them uh, indicates a deepening rift. I will start with a letter from the Audit Service Board written uh, to Mr. Daniel Yaudomilovo, dated the 16th of March 2021. The heading is Handing Over of Administration of Audit Service. We refer to the letter reference OPS 101-1-21-221 dated 3rd March 2021 from the office of the president regarding your retirement, copy attached, and request you to prepare a comprehensive handing over of the audit service to Mr. Johnson Ekuyamwa Asiedu, who has been asked to continue to act as Auditor General until the President appoints a substantive Auditor General. We will be grateful if you could complete the exercise within two weeks of receipt of this letter. Counting on your cooperation, this is signed by Professor Edward Diajman, Chairman of the Audit Service Board, and it copies the Vice President. The former Auditor General responds in a letter dated 17th of March 2021 and uh, it says uh, regarding handing over of administration of audit service. This refers to your letter dated 16th March 2021 with reference number ASB slash 01 slash volume dot 1 forward slash 20. On the above subject matter, your request for a handing over note is preposterous to me because I have been out of office for more than eight months. Furthermore, one, paragraph two of the letter from the office of the president dated 29th, June 2020, requested that I, quote, hand over all materials, ma uh, matters relating to the office of the Auditor General to Mr. Johnson Ekiamwa Asiedu, quote, closed, who has been in charge since the 1st of July, 2020. Two, the letter from the secretary to the president referred to in one above delivered to me after 4 p.m. on June 29, 2020, requested that I started the leave on the 1st of July, 2020, contrary to Section 27 of the Labor Act. The section provides that at least 30 days notice shall be given to the worker prior to the commencement of the leave. Three, the short and unlawful notice from the presidency notwithstanding, I prepared a handing over note and handed over to the acting Auditor General on the 30th of June 2020. And he has been in charge for over eight months. Four, when I resumed work on the 3rd of March 2021, Mr. Johnson Ekiamwa Asiedu did not hand over to me with the excuse that the handing over note was not ready. And... Five, after 9 p.m. of the 3rd of March 2021, the day I resumed work, I received a letter from the Secretary to the President requesting that I proceed on retirement. All the above notwithstanding, if you so wish, please direct the Acting Auditor General to hand over to me and I will thereafter hand over to him. That is signed by Daniel Yaudomelevo, copying in the Vice President, the Chief of Staff, the Secretary to the President and the Acting Auditor General of the Audit Service in Accra. Yeah. All right. Now, road safety actors uh, made up of Motor Traffic and Transport Department of the Ghana Police Service, Road Safety Authority, Driver Vehicle and Licensing Authority, and the Ghana Highway Authority are embarking on an education program on some major accident-prone areas in the eastern region. The one-month project will see routine monitoring and checks on road safety compliance on the Accra Kumase Highway, Akosumbuhu Road, Kufuridia Manfe Road, among others. Now, this exercise is also aimed at reducing carnage on the road 
before, during and after the Easter festivities. The project will see routine monitoring and checks on road safety compliance on the Accra Kumasi Highway, Akosombo Hole Road, Kofodia Mansi Road, among others in the eastern region. The exercise is also aimed at reducing the carnage on the road before, during and after the Easter festivity. Regional Manager of the Road Safety Authority, Mr. Abdullah Bawa Gamza said, the Insanwom Nkoko stretch of the Accra Kumasi Highway contribute 50% of road fatalities in the eastern region. It is one of the roads that is giving us huge figures in terms of fatalities. And it is because a lot of transit vehicles are always involved in crashes. And their type of crashes are always head-on collisions. Most of these accidents also occur between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., which means we can attribute the cause of such accidents to either fatigue or overspeeding. And mostly fatigue driving is what we attribute it to. So the NSS Highway, as I said, contributes more than 50 percent to the accident statistics in the eastern region. Well, this is where we draw a curtain on today's edition of The Pulse. It's been great. We're back with more tomorrow. Until then, you can go to myjoyonline.com for all the latest headlines from around the world. My name is Kujo Yangson. It's always a pleasure. See you tomorrow.